In this video, we're going to look at pulmonary ventilation. So this is when we look at how we breathe. Basically, how is the air moving into our lungs and how do we move the air out of our lungs? So the movement of air is all about pressure. When air is moving, it always has to move towards an area of lower pressure. It can never move to an area of higher pressure. So when we're moving air, we're comparing the air pressure between the atmosphere and the inside of our lungs, or the alveolar pressure. So how do we change the pressure inside of our thoracic cavity so that air can move in and out? Well, we have to contract muscles, and then we change the volume of the thoracic cavity. So one of the first things that I want to look at, it's called Boyle's Law. And Boyle's Law means that there is a relationship between volume and pressure. When we look at pressure, pressure is all about the movement of particles inside of a container. Molecules are always moving and they are always banging into each other. So if we increase the volume, the space for the same number of molecules, the pressure will decrease because there will be more space for these molecules to move around. If we decrease the volume, and now there's the same number of particles in a smaller space, then those molecules are more likely to bang into each other. So that will increase the pressure. So whenever we decrease the volume, we increase the pressure. And whenever we increase the volume, we decrease the pressure. When we look at our thoracic cavity, how do we change the volume? We contract muscles. So the main muscles that we're going to contract during relaxed breathing is the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles. So in this diagram, we can see when we are inhaling, so just relaxed inhaling, we are going to contract the diaphragm and the external intercostals. So the diaphragm here, when we contract the diaphragm, we are going to move it down. When we move the diaphragm down, we make this thoracic volume bigger. So the diaphragm moves down, and that increases the volume, which will cause a decrease in the pressure. When the pressure is lower inside the thoracic cavity, then air is going to move in. When we contract the external intercostals, these muscles here in between the ribs, that's going to make the ribs move up, which also increases the volume and decreases the pressure so that air moves in. When we breathe out, we simply relax those muscles and the diaphragm will move back up, make the volume smaller, which increases the pressure, which will push the air out. Same with the external intercostals. They will just relax, it will make the volume smaller, and air will move out. Now, we can also have forced inhalation or exhalation. So let's suppose we're exercising. We need to bring more air into the lungs at a time. We will add in a few other muscles. When we increase the thoracic volume even more than normal, we can pull in the sternocleidomastoid muscles to help pull the clavicles up and the scalenes. They will also contribute to making the volume bigger, which means more air will come in. Then when we have a forced exhalation, so let's suppose you're gonna cough or sneeze, then we can pull in extra muscles as well. The internal intercostals, when they contract, they are going to move in the opposite direction of the external intercostals, and they will make the volume smaller. When you decrease the volume, you're going to increase the pressure. That will make air move out. Also, think about when you cough or sneeze, you're going to use your abdominal muscles. When we use the abdominal muscles, that is also going to have an impact on the volume of our thoracic cavity. In this diagram over here, it's just a side view that shows the diaphragm. When the diaphragm contracts, it moves down, increasing the volume, which decreases the pressure, which makes us breathe in. And when we are relaxed breathing, the diaphragm will simply relax and move back up when we breathe out. 
Now I want to remind you, in the last video, we looked at the pleura. The pleura are those membranes that cover the lungs, so the visceral pleura covers the lungs, and the parietal pleura covers the thoracic cavity, the inside of the cavity. And in between there, there's a little space. When we look at this space in between the two pleural membranes, there always has to be a little bit of fluid in here so that it decreases friction, but it also has to have lower pressure compared to inside the alveoli and also compared to the atmosphere or the air outside of our body. And this pressure has to be negative so that the lungs can stay open. If there was no negative pressure in here, the lungs could collapse. Now, when we look at air pressure, we're always comparing the pressure inside of our lungs, inside the alveoli, to the outside atmospheric pressure. So the normal atmospheric pressure at sea level, we're not on a mountain, there's no thunderstorms, is about 760 millimeters of mercury of pressure. So we'll just use that as a standard, we'll just pretend that we're at sea level in normal weather. When we are moving air in, the pressure in our alveoli will be slightly negative compared to the atmosphere the entire time that air is moving. But when we stop moving air at any point in time, so breathe in a little bit and then hold it, when the air is not moving, the pressure in the atmosphere and the pressure in the alveoli is the same. But the pressure in that pleural space is always a little bit negative. It's always a little bit less than the alveolar pressure compared to the atmosphere pressure. So if we have a look at this diagram, we can see that one atmosphere of pressure is about 760 millimeters of mercury. When we are at rest, the alveolar pressure is the same. When the air is not moving, the pressure in our lungs is the same as the air around us. But the intrapleural pressure is a little bit less. It is always somewhere around three to four millimeters of mercury lower than the alveolar pressure, and this keeps our lungs expanded. And then when we look at exhaling and inhaling, when we exhale, the atmospheric pressure is the same, and the alveolar pressure is going to be a little bit higher. We increase the pressure so that the air can move out. But the intrapleural pressure is always a little bit lower compared to the alveolar pressure. Same when we're breathing in. Atmospheric pressure is about 760. The alveolar pressure is going to be a little bit lower that way air is going to move in and the intrapleural pressure is always a little bit less compared to the alveolar pressure. If you punctured that space, say you got stabbed and then we didn't have that negative pressure, then the lungs would collapse and that's called a pneumothorax. So we need to have that negative pressure in the intrapleural space. There's two main things that allow the lungs to expand easily and to be able to push the air out easily. Those two things are compliance and recoil. Compliance is how much the lungs can expand. And if you had a condition like uh, chronic inflammatory bronchitis, then you would have less compliance. It would be harder to expand your lungs to allow air to move in. We also need to have surfactant, which we talked about in the last video. Surfactant is that oil substance that helps the lungs to decrease surface tension because we have um, a little bit of water where the oxygen has to diffuse or the carbon dioxide has to diffuse before we can move it in and out of the bloodstream. So having enough surfactant decreases the surface tension, which increases the compliance and that makes it easier to breathe. And then the other factor is recoil. So if you have an elastic and you stretch it, 
When the elastic goes back to normal, that's recoil. We need the lungs to be able to recoil so that we can easily push the air out. And people that have a condition like emphysema do not have the recoil. It's harder to push the air out. And that's why people with emphysema can look like they have a barrel chest. It looks like they're always inhaling. Now I want to look at lung volumes. So first, let's just think about resting breathing. You breathe in and out. And that's just about maybe 500 milliliters of air volume that we're moving during normal resting breathing. And that volume is called the tidal volume. Now think about breathing in normally and then breathing in even more. That's our inspiratory capacity, that full amount of air that we can breathe in. We always have a reserve. There's always extra amount. Same when you breathe out. And then we also, even when you breathe all the air out completely as much as you possibly can there is always still a little bit left and that is your reserve your residual volume that we never exhale now let's have a look at this chart the normal amount that we breathe in and out at rest is called our tidal volume when you breathe in and then you breathe in more this full volume is called your inspiratory capacity. After you've breathed in your normal amount, we have an inspiratory reserve. Same with exhaling. After you exhale the normal amount, you have an expiratory reserve volume. When you add up the full amount that you can breathe in with the full amount that you can breathe out, this is our vital capacity. And then we always have this residual volume after the full amount that you can exhale. There's always a little bit left. That's called your residual volume. When you breathe out normally, if you include the expiratory reserve along with the residual volume, this full amount is your functional residual capacity. When you add up all of the volumes, the vital capacity is the full amount you can breathe in and the full amount you can breathe out. When you also then include the residual volume, that gives you your total lung capacity, which is somewhere around six liters for an average adult. Now, larger people are going to have larger lung capacities and smaller people will have smaller lung capacities. The last thing I wanna show you in this video is how to calculate alveolar ventilation. This is the amount of air that gets into the alveoli that will be available for gas exchange, for oxygen to be able to move into the capillaries in the lungs. In the last video, we talked about the conducting zone and the respiratory zone. The respiratory zone is where we can have gas exchange, and the conducting zone is simply the tubes that transport the air through the lungs, like the trachea and the bronchi and the bronchioles. Now, the air in that space cannot have gas exchange. So we call that a dead space. It's like if you try to swim in a pool by breathing through a garden hose. Okay, you can breathe through a snorkel, but if you made that snorkel really, 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 really long, and then think about the air movement with each breath, if you are only moving 500, even a bit more air with each breath, that dead space can't be larger than your tidal volume. Otherwise, you're never going to have fresh oxygen to be able to diffuse into your capillaries. So the structures in the conducting zone, that's your dead space. We have to remove that from our tidal volume to see the full amount of air that's available for gas exchange in the alveoli. So when we look at alveolar ventilation, we calculate that by looking at the tidal volume so let's suppose a normal adult tidal volume is around 500 mils. And then we have to subtract the dead space. 
we have to remove the amount of volume of air that is not going to be involved in gas exchange. And in a typical adult, that is around 150 mils. So we have to subtract 150 from 500 and we will get a 350 mils. Now, we calculate alveolar ventilation per minute. So we are going to multiply that by the respiratory rate. An average resting respiratory rate is around 12 breaths per minute. So then we multiply the 350 times 12 and we end up with 4200 mils per minute. Or we can change that to 4.2 liters per minute. That is the amount of air that is available for gas exchange per minute.